and it's the webinar is now live it says it's recording so <laughs> we are on the right night aren't we <laughs> all coming in it seems yeah so welcome to katie's evening <laughs> Oh, we we're off, we're off and running. Sorry, Sue. I, yes, let me. Um, hang on, I haven't got that little bit up. I can't see. Hi, hello, and good evening, everybody. Um, nice to have you here joining us at Surrey Wildlife Trust for another wonderful event. Um, we have got the wonderful Katie Fielding with us again. She was delivering a session last week. And um, my name's Emma. A few of you might um, recognise me from a few of the other presentations we've done. If not, very nice to see you all. I'm one of the adult learning tutors up at um, Nowwood at Surrey Wildlife Trust. And my colleague, Sue O'Regan, who also joined Katie last week. Um, so while we are just letting a few more people in, if you just bear with us, um, and then we will get ourselves up and running. Uh, let's just have a little look. How we're we doing. We're buzzing along we've got quite a few people coming in. I think we're expecting about we've got about 50 people um, booked in for this evening um, and we have got 26 people in so far so uh, um, oh we've got a little question just come in let me just have a little read Hello, James Saunders um, from Bristol, UK. Yes, um, this video is being saved to rewatch later. I'll explain that um, a little bit more than when, ev when everybody else arrives. Um, so if you just want to just bear with us for a couple more minutes and while we've got people coming in, flooding in, Katie, they're obviously uh, very impressed with your topic of conversation. So uh, yeah. Yeah, we'll Brilliant. be as well. <laughs> and uh, yes, hopefully we'll, uh, we've, I can recognise some names from who came last week as well. Um, I do think the webinars are a little bit weird because we, we can't see you. All we can see is a list of names of people coming in, um, whereas uh, you guys I know can see us. So it's, yeah, we're pinging in quite nicely. So excellent. All right, well, I hope you're all sitting comfortably. You've got yourself a nice beverage for the evening um, to enjoy during Katie's presentation. Um, we shall just give that, I think we'll just give it another minute, Katie, just to no problem. see if um, we sort of seem to be stabling out. Um, let me just have a little look. Yeah. Okay, I think we're up to about 37. Right. Okay, well, just we'll, um, there's still a, a couple more people just, just popping in. Um, but just, yes, just to welcome everybody and say thank you very much um, for coming to join us once again. Um, you'll uh, be missing Sophie this week because um, she's, she's, busy being um, a homeschool teacher at the moment so she's passed on the reins to myself and Sue to uh, uh, fly solo with you tonight so uh, hopefully all, all will go well but just a couple of um, little reminders if you haven't attended one of our events before um, Katie will be doing um, a presentation all about wonderful hedgerows um, during that presentation um, we would ask you to remain in mute mode, if that's okay, so that um, the presentation that Katie does, the sound quality stays really high. 
Um, you may have a question for Katie and by all means use the Q&A button down at the bottom on the bottom um, part of your screen. There is a Q&A function for those of you who have not attended one of these before. So if you want to um, have a question that you want to write in there, you can write that at any time during the presentation and that question will come directly into one of into the three of us. Um, and Sue will be checking through all of those questions. And once Katie has finished her presentation, we will read those questions out loud for Katie to be able to um, answer. You can also use the chat function. Um, the chat function is just for um, myself, Sue and Katie. Um, and that's more if you have sort of a, a technical issue or um, something else that you just want us to be able to see. Whereas in the Q&A session, um, everybody can see those questions. So you can see if somebody's, or, you know, if you've got a question, you think, oh, yeah, somebody's already answered that. So you can, you can see the Q&A bit, but you won't be able to see the chat session. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that's probably all of the, the housekeeping bits and pieces. We've got people popping in. I think we're up to 37 now, so we're quite um, well in with that. Um, Katie, are you all ready and set to go? Yep, I am. I'll start sharing my screen. Okay, wonderful. Mm -hmm. So I shall hand you over to Katie and enjoy our wonderful presentation this evening. Can you, is, can you see that, Emma? Yes, I can. I have to check these things because last week I thought I was sharing my screen and whether it was my error or anything else, I wasn't for a while. So that's good. The first, <laughs> the first point has gone well. Well, but welcome everyone. And thank you so much for joining us for yet another webinar about hedgerows. It feels a little bit like deja vu, but I'm really pleased that so many people are taking an interest in it and are wanting to learn a little bit more. Last week, we were talking a lot about just hedgerows in general, why they're fantastic and great to have, and all of those functions that they can fulfill. This week, we're talking a bit more about their management as well. Now, there is going to be some overlap with the previous presentation. Uh, you'll see some slides if you were here last week, you'll get some repetition, but we'll be talking about them slightly differently and backing up other points. But hopefully, you should definitely be going away knowing a little bit more about hedgerow management. There we go. Frozen screen for a second. It never goes completely uh, smoothly. So in this webinar, we're going to talk a little bit about Hedgerow Heritage. So that's the project that is funded by Heritage Lottery Fund. So why we have got funding to do things for hedgerows, why they're so great, but also how they're great and how we can make them even better. Hedgerows fulfill a lot of fantastic ecosystem services and various functions but they can't do that without some hedgerow TLC, and that means management. So first of all, hedgerow heritage, I'm lucky enough to project manage a fantastic project, which is relatively new and is funded by Heritage Lottery funding. So thank you so much to Heritage Lottery. We wouldn't be able to do all the fantastic work that we're doing and going to do over the next four years. There was a development phase with the project, but we're now in that delivery phase, and that will be going forth over the next three years as began at the start of 2020. Not that we were able to do quite as much as we would have liked to, but hey, you've got to roll with these things. So first of all, looking at where the project area is, the project is focused in the North Downs, which you can see hopefully on the map to your right there. The blue boundary denotes the North Downs area, which is our one of our biodiversity opportunity areas. And we're working with five fantastic partners on the project. And that's West Horsley Place, Clandon Wood Natural Burial Ground, Sons Place Farm, the National Trust and Guildford Borough Council. And hopefully you can see that the project partners are colored pink in the picture and then SWT land that we're either directly managing or involved with managing is in that blue color. So the plan is to link some of these areas up a bit better and maps like this really help us do that. So aims of the project, I hear you say, well, it's obviously to have more hedgerows in the North Downs, but not only more hedgerows, 
It's about that condition and getting them into better management. It's one thing to have hedgerows. It's another how they're being managed. Having hedgerows simply isn't enough. It requires them to be well managed and looked after. And that's what a huge part of this project is about. Not only is it about getting physical hedgerows in the ground and in better condition, it's also about engaging with local communities and their natural heritage, reinvigorating that knowledge and history and starting to generate a new younger generation of hedge layers into the future. There's a big focus on youth in the project. So some of these aims practically on the ground are 6.5 kilometers of new hedgerows managed. Now that's either planted or laid. And there's a, an example of a laid hedge by one of our lovely uh, colleagues. Um, and all of this 6.5 kilometers of hedgerows is on our partnership sites. Now, all of this is all mapped out. It's all agreed. All we've got to do is get out there and do it, right? Yeah, sounded simple until COVID hit. So unfortunately, we've not actually been able to do any of that in 2020, but all the foundations are there. We're ready to go and hopefully this autumn we'll be out there planting and laying lots of hedgerows. Another huge point for the project is getting 63 kilometres of hedgerows into management plans. Now none of these hedgerows are identified yet. The only uh, limiting factor that we have to take into account is that they need to be in the North Downs. And the way in which we're going to identify these is by training up and sending an army of volunteers out into the North Downs to survey hedges. So we're going to need lots of volunteers. And a big part of what I'll be doing between now and the start of spring is develop that training to get people ready to go. And once we can identify those hedgerows, know what kind of condition they're in, we can start to develop those management plans as well. Another big part of the project is the education. So I'll be working with five secondary schools to develop a education pack, uh, which will really help schools to understand hedgerows more about those kind of management ideals as well and what they can do in their school grounds. And we'll be running lots of events and activities as well. And also an OCN accredited hedge lane course so people can help build towards their conservation career but also looking at educating local authorities and land managers, again, about management, about why hedgerows are great and why we should have more of them in the North Downs. There's also loads of events involved with the project. So fingers crossed, we will be having a hedgerow festival at some point during the project when hopefully once the vaccine is rolled out and COVID guidance allows, we'll be able to have a really fantastic hedgerow festival. Uh, hopefully I would like to have it at one of our partnership sites could be West Horsley Place as focused in the picture here. Also looking at running three hedge laying competitions, 15 bio blitzes and education events, and then lots of guided walks, an innovative hedgerow tales program, which we're actually looking at how we can take that virtually at the moment, and even an exhibition at Dorking Museum. Obviously COVID has set us back recently and we are just having to be a little bit innovative and look at how we do things and try and do it a little bit differently and reimagine what participation is. Before the project, uh, participation was all about people on the ground and now everything is virtual. So we're really looking at developing our website, taking Hedgerow Tales online. We're looking at developing an animation that we can roll out to really engage with young people and get it out into schools. Uh, obviously doing webinars like this one and also developing our social media content. But we're all looking to the spring and summer where we're hoping we'll be able to get out and about a bit more and we can really look at getting that surveying effort going, maybe have some events, at least some guided walks, continue to work with schools and develop that virtual presence as well. So why are we doing all this? Why are we investing in hedgerows? Why do we have such a large project within Surrey Wildlife Trust dedicated to it? Well, quite simply, hedgerows are great. There, if for those that came along to the webinar last week, and you will hear a lot about why hedgerows are great from this one as well, but they do fantastic things for our environment. They provide food and shelter, safe passage for our wildlife. They give grain and texture to farmland, enhance habitats, as well as fill other niches and provide numerous ecosystem services. So, you know, they're carrying quite a lot. However, in spite of all of this, hedgerows are really struggling and they need our help. Unfortunately, they cannot function this well. They cannot provide all these services without good management. 
So hedgerows are really dynamic entities and in much of the same way that a lot of our other habitats, um, they're very successional. All those plants that within that hedge are always growing. A lot of them are trees, you know, we call them shrubs and hedgerows and we forget sometimes maybe that the plants in there want to become big tall trees. So there needs some intervention. You know, fundamentally hedgerows are a man-made habitat and like other man-made habitats like heathland and chalkland grassland and moorland, it does need intervention and management to keep them at their optimum levels and help them develop well. So before I go on um, more about management, those that joined us last week will know that I like a little bit of history. So I'm not gonna go on about it for ages, but I think a quick overview is really interesting to kind of understand how we've got to this point and where hedgerows have come from. So hedgerows were first used by early farmers to separate livestock from other crops, which I feel like most people know. Uh, the first mention of a hedge being planted was at Kingston Langley in Wiltshire by Alfred, which is a really ancient monk, um, as early as 940 AD. And there's a lot of words maybe associated with hedgerows and old ones. These are two that I quite like. And we have hagger, which comes from the old English word meaning an enclosure itself, which is derived from the Saxon word for hawthorn. And then this one's my favorite is hege, which quite literally means is transferred from the Saxon word for living boundary rather than a mere fence. And I just don't think there's really anything that sums up a hedgerow quite as well as that. <laughs> so sometimes hedges are considered quite recent artifacts. And while that is the case in some places, a lot of them are much, much older. So some were created in sort of the 18th and 19th century in response to the Parliamentary Enclosures Act that when we're talking about hedgerows, we often hear about quite a lot. However, some are much older and hold much greater historic value. So in most counties, they are considerably older and not just related to that uh, parliamentary act. So in Devon, a quarter of all hedges are reckoned to be over 800 years old. Um, and indeed Dartmoor, some hedges are clearly identified as part of the Reeve system, which are long trap lines that extend over hill and vale of Dartmoor, indicating tribal boundaries back to the Bronze Age. So that's more like 3,000 500 years ago, so considerably older than the 18th and 19th century. And again, hedgerows are just so interesting. They really do provide sometimes our only record of man's use of the countryside over hundreds of years. I often find myself now that I'm a little bit better educated about hedgerows walking in the countryside and see perhaps an ancient line of oak trees or trees like this, which have been coppiced hundreds of years ago and I think hmm, ancient hedgerow or old boundary line and once you start looking for it they're really quite hard to miss quite often because they're pretty large as well but uh, not only are they seeped in history themselves and help us understand how the countryside has been used many of them are archaeological sites in their own right as well they contain artifacts and plant fossils they preserve pollen and much more information below their bases So having talked a little bit about the history of hedgerows, there is also a lot of history in hedge laying styles. Now, we're just going to have a quick chat about this now because anyone who's been to my webinars or some of my other talks knows that I can go off on a bit of a tangent and get far too excited about a subtopic. And you, again, could do an entire presentation on the various hedge laying styles and how they've developed over hundreds of years, given with the areas they're in. But I'll just sum it up in saying that there are around 30 styles recorded in the UK, even more in Europe from places like France, Germany and Holland. And in Holland, it's known as hedge weaving, which I think is really lovely. And reasonably recently, hedge laying has made its way over to Canada, mostly because of one fantastic hedgerow hero who was involved with the beginnings of this project, the wonderful Jim Jones, who has emigrated out to Canada now and is <laughs> bringing the hedge laying styles with him as well, as well as many other wonderful things. So we're excited that he's still involved with this project in some ways and wishing him all of that luck over in Canada. But all of these styles, they have developed independently of each other in many ways. They've 
developed to cope with the climates of their area. So hedge laying in Wales is very different to hedge laying in the south of England, which is very different from hedge laying in Scotland or northern England. So it really had to deal with that climate and what they were facing, but also those farming practices as well. So whether they had um, animals that they're trying to protect the the hedge from or whether it's purely arable or a mix of both as well, which you'll see from a few examples of the hedge laying styles that we have here. So of course we have to start with the south of England because that is the one that we are doing most of the time with the hedgerow heritage project. project. This hedge is cut and layered over to create a double brush, meaning there is brash or leafy bushy material on both sides of the hedge. And there is a single line of stakes, which are 18 inches apart and driven into the ground and then woven or bound at the top with binders, which is usually hazel or other very malleable woods. And both sides of the hedge are trimmed. You'll see in the example here, this is a hedge that we laid over in Godston as a bit of a training hedge with some of our employees. This is actually almost exclusively an elm hedge. And you can see that the other, even though it has been done in the South of England style, on the other side, we haven't cut it all around the side because it just wasn't really practical. But what's also really interesting about elm is most of us have heard of Dutch elm disease. And it seems that the trees get to a certain age and then they start to die back. And when we were laying this hedge, we encountered really large amounts of rot and dieback. And by laying it like this, even though it looks like we've effectively killed it, this will really invigorate it with new life. So I'm really excited to revisit that hedge in the summer and see how it's doing. Another style that's similar to the South of England style, but a bit different is the Midland style. And this one's really interesting because it was developed because of that mixed farming method. So whether you've got stock or also arable. So you can see from the picture that all of the bushy material has been pushed to one side of the hedge and all of those stems and pleaches are all exposed on the other. This is because on the bushy side, they would have had uh, sheep or cows or horses. And this creates much more of a barrier against that livestock. They're gonna get deterred by the spiky material of hawthorn or blackthorn and struggle to get to the stems. Because if they could have access to that stem, that could kill the plant. And then on the side, where all the stems are exposed, that's where you'd have your arable crops, which don't need as much protection. So that's a really interesting style as well. Like I say, it does make that one side robust against stock and not on the other. So it's only suitable in that way. It's also got stakes and binders in a similar way to the South of England. And just to give you an example of one other style of hedge laying, we've got a Welsh border style. What's different about this one is we've got those sawn timber stakes that are driven in at an angle and 30 inches apart. But those binders, oh, not the binders, the stakes are much stronger, but it's still bound at the top. And what's also really interesting is that dead wood is used in the hedge to protect the regrowth from being browsed by stock. There's a lot of sheep in Wales, you need to protect your hedge. And the dead wood and live pleachers are bound down in the same way. So again, with that malleable wood, they will all be bound up to make it very robust. So that's just, an example of just how broad hedge laying can be and it's a fascinating topic and it's seeped in history and some of the styles are just so beautiful but we're here to talk about management so we can't just talk about hedge laying styles all night. So moving on a little bit um, I'm sure a lot of you might be interested in garden hedgerows uh, so I thought we'd spend a bit of time talking about that. Lots of the questions from last week were what are the benefits of garden hedgerows? How can I have a garden hedgerows? And actually, whether you're planting it in your garden, whether you're looking at having it on a field or in parkland, a lot of the same principles fit. So you'll be able to scale up at times. So first of all, that is fantastic. If you want to have a hedgerow in your garden, lucky you and what a fantastic idea. They are really lovely things. We would always advise having native plants. You're only going to get more beauty from it and more diversity and more interest, and more wildlife interest if you use native plants. But I'm going to talk about that a lot in a bit. And it can really help to connect up part of your garden. So creates that corridor for wildlife, that safe passage, but also is really nice natural screening as well. And if you do want to lay a hedge in your garden, you may have no need for a real fence. They can be that secure. 
and then you're going to be able to let hedgehogs through as well as other lots of other bits of wildlife it's fantastic habitat and also a beautiful and fantastic addition to your garden so when we say garden hedgerow there's probably a lot of different options out there and people picture different things so if we're looking in that top left this is obviously a box hedge and is one species although not as diverse and good for wildlife as others it's better than having nothing we've actually got um, various styles and species of beech here as a full beech um, hedge in the middle and the top right we've got quite an interesting example of a hedgerow and um, maybe again not quite what you would expect in that it's not necessarily all native plants it's not plants all the way but it is creating that continuous corridor through your garden bottom left it's very much about screening and then these two at the bottom are really interesting as well and um, we've got a single species poplar um, privet hedge but then with a really wide margin <clears throat> with a native wildflower and that's actually green alkanet which is fantastic for pollinators so it's not always just about the hedgerow itself it's also about the base and its margin and then we've got a really young itty bitty hedge there that isn't quite that connected up corridor yet but I think we can all agree it's still really pretty it's a really attractive feature it's flowering it's budding it's providing nectar and it will provide berries and it's a safe haven for invertebrates as well so although it's not at full maturity yet it's still providing some of those uh, ecosystem services and really good for wildlife so if you want to plant a hedge in your garden there are some things that are worth considering it's very much a winter job. You want to do this when the plants are dormant and there's less competition in the ground as well. Ideally, you will prepare the ground. You don't have to, but it will just help success rate if it's having to be less. And so when I say prepare, I mean clear back all other vegetation. Choose your plants very carefully. That's all I'm gonna say now because I'm gonna go on and on about it in a bit. Uh, and then you can mulch and chip around the plants once you've put them in afterwards. And that will help to fight against competition, stop weeds. I don't really like using the word weeds, but I'll use it here sparingly. And competition from other plants in the garden. Or an alternative to mulch and chip. If your gardens are anything like mine, then you've been, it's been filled with leaves through the autumn and winter. And most people will rake those up and put them in their garden waste or on their compost and they're gone. Another alternative is just to bundle those up and instead of using mulch and chip in the same way you would have used that, use that leaf litter and therefore you're using what's natural in your garden. Leaf litter is a habitat for invertebrates in itself and so you're just using what's already present in your garden which is a really fantastic thing to do. Plant options. There's a lot out there. There's a, and not everything will be right for everyone. So generally, the younger the plants and the smaller they are, the cheaper they are. You also have bare root and root ball options, and you need to look into the benefits and negatives of those. Again, it will vary from garden to garden and generally depends on budget quite a lot as well. I've included this picture because this is just off a website selling native hedging plants, but they sell it in a trough and you've already got your pretty much your formed hedge in a really attractive way. The plants are a lot more mature they're starting to intertwine with each other and you're just saving you're, you're you're already getting that natural screening it's going to provide a lot of those wildlife benefits and attract a lot to your garden but obviously it's not right for everyone they are quite expensive but it's a really nice idea if people sometimes shy away from having native plants in favor of conifers or leylandi or even laurel or uh Rhodey's not really suitable as a hedge but provides that screening if that's what people are looking for those screening hedge plants then this can be a really good alternative in that you've already got quite large plants that are quite well formed that can form that uh, those functions as well so native all the way um, when I say native I'm sure some of you are wondering what I mean well generally the basis of native hedge plants is blackthorn and hawthorn and those are those top two over here so we've got our blackthorn and then our hawthorn and then there can be all kinds of variety that associate and mix in with that to form a native hedge we've got hazel up here on the right got beautiful field maple down here 
um, dog rose, which people sometimes forget about. And then holly can often be very good in gardens as well. But then over here, we've got bramble. So there are lots more plants that can go in with hedging. Sometimes we have oaks, basically any tree can be included with those native hedge plants, as long as you've got that base of some of these fundamentals as well, especially that blackthorn and hawthorn, which will provide that spiky cover for wildlife and also really attractive. Um, but then I've included things like we've got bramble down here and then also ivy. Now, although many of these, many people consider some of these kinds of species as a pest species or something undesirable to have in gardens, bramble flowers are a vital resource for wildlife. And then the blackberry fruits are incredibly valuable, especially for things before they're building up fat reserves before they go into winter. Ivy provides autumn nectar and vitally winter berries as well. And some species are almost exclusively uh, reliant on species like this, including things like the holly blue butterfly that won't be found in a hedge unless there's holly or ivy in it. So just worth considering what may be trying to park what we think of as pests. And as long as these things are kept under control, they can be really valuable in our gardens as well. So there is a lot of care associated with our hedge, and this is the same as a regular hedge, whether it's in a garden or not, but we're going to go through that in more detail. The only thing I would say is avoid overwatering. You've put all that effort in, you're really proud, you really want to look after your hedge, people can end up overwatering. But that is the wrong thing to do. What you want to do is really water sparingly and only if there's been quite a severe drought because you want those plants to get used to the natural conditions so you aren't having to always water them. So having talked a bit about our garden hedgerows and options that we can have and how those options and all of those options and talking about them in a garden way can just be scaled up for whether that's on farmland areas, parkland or even nature reserves that we plant hedgerows in all the same kind of principles and some of the pictures that were in there were of us planting on farmland and various areas. So having talked about that I thought it'd be lovely to talk about some of those species that benefit and that demonstrate what's so valuable about hedgerows and why we make those considerations to varying plants and how could we do that without talking about the hazel dormouse who is one of our most iconic and threatened hedgerow species. Now ha hazel dormice despite the name making it sound like they are reliant on hazel, are actually more reliant on hedgerows in general and will only eat hazelnuts at certain times of year when they're available. And it really is a vital dispersal corridor for the dormouse. They have a very varied diet, which I'll talk about in a moment. And many areas of habitats can't support populations on their own. So those hedgerows help the animals get between different places so that they can find that variety they need. And actually small copses and small areas may not be able to support the population on their own. Even a small gap is considered quite a significant obstacle to a dormouse. They are very arboreal. They don't really like to touch the ground. They prefer to be up in the branches like this little guy in the picture. So it really is vital to their survival in many ways because a lot of our habitats are incomplete and can't support them on their own. Not only that, but actually hedgerows are a vital habitat to dormice in themselves. A study done by the Royal Holloway University of London found that hedgerows hold as high a numbers of breeding dormice as woodlands do. So therefore, losses of hedgerows not only can lead to isolated populations and populations becoming very vulnerable and therefore lead to potentially local extinctions because they can't get around. Less hedgerows also means less habitat in itself for dormice. So really vital for this species. So just to highlight the variety that the dormouse needs and how a hedgerow can fill this, I thought we'd run through a typical year as a dormouse. So emerges, bit sleepy, bit hungry, pretty lazy dormice. I identify with them well. But when they emerge from hibernation, they're looking to feed quite quickly. And they start off trying to put on those fat reserves back on with blackthorn fruit, uh, not fruit, not yet, blackthorn blossom and hawthorn blossom. As the year goes on, they move on to eating ash keys in the summer, as well as wild honeysuckle flowers, and even the odd invertebrate 
such as aphids, where they can find them. As they're now moving into the autumn, they're filling up on blackberries and of course the hazelnuts now that they're available in autumn, putting on that fat reserves again to go back um, into hibernation. So really they're a pretty high maintenance, like cute little rodent, but we all let them get away with it because they are pretty cute. But I think that really highlights just that variety and what's needed in that diversity in our hedgerows and in environments in general and woodlands. So from talking about life and vitality and variety in a living hedge, I really wanted to talk about a dead, dead hedging as well, because I got some really interesting questions about it last week in the presentation about is a dead hedge good? And actually dead hedges are fantastic and have lots of the same benefits of a regular hedge in that they provide lots of safe havens for wildlife, lots of breeding opportunities and uh, just life cycle in general for countless invertebrates. And therefore, if it's full of invertebrates, it's a great hunting ground for small mammals and birds as well. Ground nesting birds will nest in it, small mammals will. So there's a lot of those same benefits that you get from a living hedge. But if, it's, if a living hedge isn't quite the right fit for your garden, then a dead hedge can be a really nice alternative. And it is a lot less maintenance. Um, and as the material dies down or dies back and breaks down, you can just keep adding to it as well. So I've included that picture at the top because it's quite a big one, but it can be as big or as small as you want. Um, when citing it, do think about linking up those habitats within your garden as well as it being tucked away for you. It doesn't have to be massive. And I thought I'd just share a couple of pictures of some dead hedging we did on one of our nature reserves. So these are pictures from Westfield Common. We were doing some holly clearance in the area and rather than taking the material off site, which would have been really costly or burning it, which we didn't really want to do because um, it's a relatively built up area. And if we don't have to burn things, we're not going to. Instead, we used all the material to dead hedge. Um, and it's what a fantastic result. We haven't staked it. I know the two pictures before showed them being staked. You don't have to stake a dead hedge. And this was done at the end of 2019 and has survived. I took these pictures at the end of last year. So 2020 in December. So, and as you can see, it survived. There loads of people have been using the woodland. There's lots of dens in these areas, but the dead hedging has survived. So it's clearly being valued and providing a fantastic habitat for wildlife. And what was I gonna say then? we'll keep going and we can keep adding to it as we do more of the work as well. So having talked about door mice, I really just wanted to focus on bats for a little bit because I think it's really interesting how a ground mammal, which we can kind of, it's easier for us to associate how those are really, you can really value hedgerows, whereas bats are a flying species, we may not think they're as reliant, but if anything, they're as reliant on hedgerows as door mice. So most of us know bats use echolocation and therefore rely on things like linear landscape features like hedgerows and waterways and woodland edges to navigate around our countryside. And those linear features can really form the commuting routes and aid that navigation. Not only that, they also provide shelter and roosting opportunities for bats and a network of well-connected hedgerows and other linear features like those waterways and banks can really help to increase the amount that they can forage and roost and that capacity to do so. Not only that, where it means they don't have to go back to the big, their main roost and can overnight, especially if there's standing trees as well within that hedgerow. And obviously hedgerows are a really good habitat for insects and therefore it's creating more food sources for those bats as well. So just delving a little bit deeper into bats, I wanted to talk about the greater horseshoe bat. So this little guy, despite having a very large ears, unfortunately, the call um, from that echolocation disappears very rapidly into the open with this particular species. So therefore, they have an even greater reliance on those linear features and use it for navigation in such a stronger way. Without them, they can risk getting lost and disorientated in the environment. Not only that, greater horseshoe bats are a species that do what we call gleaning. 
which is where they actually take prey directly from foliage in the hedge. So hedgerows are even more associated with how they hunt and not just moving around in the landscape. And they reckon with greater horseshoe bats that almost all hunting occurs within 10 meters of a hedge. So really vital for this species. Really sadly, the greater horseshoe bat is locally extinct in Surrey. However, quite exciting, it was recently rediscovered in West Sussex. And we don't really know if they have always been there and just not been discovered, or if this might be them recovering after a great decline which occurred in the 20th century. Either way, we need to get all of our hedgerows and our gardens in tip top condition for when they eventually make their way back to Surrey. So just to highlight how you can manage things differently depending on how you're managing for different species. There are some specific things to consider for bats. Now this is more of a landscape scale approach rather than gardens. So this is like we're looking on farmland or nature reserves or bigger open spaces. And obviously coppicing, which is when you take their plant right down to the base so lots of new shoots can come up and laying a hedge will lead to thick and bushy hedgerows rather than flailing or cutting back the hedge really heavily, consider only cutting the side and letting it grow up more. So bats are using hedgerows in the same way they would use a woodland edge. So the more a hedgerow can re resemble a woodland edge, the better. So allowing standard trees, so just large trees to grow up within the hedgerow and leaving the hedge to get a little bit more wild will benefit bats enormously. Obviously having a plan, and managing rotationally is beneficial to all hedgerows and allowing those hedge and margin plants to flower and produce berries. So not just the hawthorns and the blackthorns, but also that ivy and those late fruiting and late nectar species, as well as the margin to flower and produce that food will attract even more wildlife in. In the same way as last week, I can't do a presentation about hedgerows without at least mentioning the hedgehog. And they are your classic inhabitant of edge habitat in the same kind of linear feature way with bats. So they are on your woodland edge, your hedgerows, margins, and very rarely go out into wide open spaces. And for a hedge to really benefit the hedgehog, it, the base needs to be really thick and with that wide field margin. And so, if you're translating that into your garden, you perhaps want a flowering base, but we'll talk more about that later on. And we really need those hedgerows to be linking up habitats. Like I said, hedgehogs will not crouch cross wide spaces generally if they don't have to. They really try and avoid that open ground. So if the hedgerows can be linking woodland areas, wet areas, and keeping that continuity in the landscape, that's really valuable for hedgehogs. Obviously, birds are really associated with hedgerows, whether it's hedgerows in our garden, shrubs or trees, we see a lot of birds using them. And obviously, taller hedges equals more habitat and can hold more breeding territories for those birds. And scrubby open woodland species also use hedgerows, so you've got those more denser canopy birds, which are your typical garden birds like your robins and blackbirds, but also you see a lot of different species using hedgerows in farmland as well, such as yellowhammer and linnets. Not only will they breed in hedgerows and use them to find food, they also hold territorial perches on the top, good vantage bases, and will even nest in the hedgerow base. In the same way that I said last week, we could have a whole presentation talking about how invertebrates use hedgerows and we wouldn't even scratch the surface. I am in no doubt whatsoever that there are tens, if not hundreds of species invertebrates that we haven't even discovered yet that are definitely using hedgerows as well as other habitats. Not least of all, really, really tiny micro uh, solitary wasps, which are teeny tiny. Um, I was at the Natural History Museum a couple of years ago, looking at some of their records and they were saying, we don't think that we have identified all of the solitary wasps. In fact, we keep finding new species. So they're out there, they're everywhere. Hedgerows are really important for invertebrates 
Um, they are that supply of food, whether that's nectar or fruiting bodies or decaying matter at the bottom, plant litter, deadwood, you name it, there will be an invertebrate that is using that niche and microhabitat. And obviously it's really important breeding sites as well. Not only are they providing those kinds of services, it's also been proven that they guide the activity of bumblebees. So in the same way bats are using them as linear features, we think bumblebees use them to navigate as well. More than 20 species of butterfly breed in hedgerows. We've already talked about the holly blue. Um, I'll also mention the uh, brown hair streak later. But also, not only are they breeding in them in the same kind of way that birds do, they use them as territorial and perching sites. And I have seen butterflies try and uh, take on birds and ward them off before. And another one that you might not necessarily consider as benefiting from hedgerows are reptiles. But again, they're really valuable corridors to these species that don't like to be out in the open. Um, for hedgerows to be even more valuable for invertebrates, uncultivated margins left to get long and tussocky and provide that better protection and can also defend about against grazing in a farming environment and a hedge having a sunny side for all of the reptiles. I can relate, I miss the sun at the moment. So we've talked about some of the species that are benefiting from those hedges and obviously I feel like I've, I've kind of touched upon it but hedgerows are not only fulfilling their own services they're also filling niches as well. Uh, so really sadly, our landscape is incomplete. We're losing a lot of our vital habitats, our ancient woodlands, our veteran trees, our waterways, our wildflower meadows. And hedges are so good that they can help to fill those other niches in the, in the same way that bats kind of see them as woodland edges. I'm not saying a hedgerow can fulfill all the uh, uses of a stream, but they do have wet areas, they do provide that corridor, amphibians are using them. They're very helpful in our sadly incomplete landscape to help plug those gaps. So how are hedgerows doing this? I'm sure by now you're thinking, wow, hedgerows are great, in the same way I hoped that those that here last week did. Um, the key to all of this that they're able to do is variety. You know, hedgerows can be really biodiverse and it's all about those niches and microhabitats so that there's lots of different ways for wildlife to inhabit it and exploit it and use it. And different species will use those different niches. So I'm just going to run through some of those key hedgerow components just to identify and kind of highlight how those different species can do that and those different elements that are within a hedge. So we've got five main ones without me getting into crazy levels of detail. And we've got standing or standard trees, the shrubby component, the hedge bottom, and then the bank, including ditches and the hedge margin. So first of all, talking about hedgerow trees, lots of species will use these as a vantage point. You get lots of invertebrates buzzing around the tops of trees, as well as various bird species as well. The brown hair streak is a really interesting one. They spend a lot of their time in the tops of trees um, or buried in hedgerows. They're very, even though they're the largest of our hedgerow um, hair streak species, they're really elusive. And some of the only times that they are seen is when the females are laying their small white eggs in hawthorn branches. Not only are invertebrates using them, but birds, as we say, sing and display and really approve and use those hedgerow trees. And also it provides lots of nesting holes, not least of all for the lovely tree sparrow. However, hedgerow trees are in decline. One study found that there was a loss of 3.9% through 1997 to 2000 which maybe doesn't sound like a lot, but that figure is only going up. And that's quite an alarming amount over just three years or so, especially with the rate of loss of our veteran trees and our ancient woodland. Many of priority biodiversity action plan species are really dependent on those hedgerow tree elements. And the more mature the trees are, and if they're a veteran tree, even more species are reliant on them. 
So second, talking about that shrubby component in a hedge, which is probably the bit of the hedge that you most think of when someone says hedgerow. And it's that habitat that's created by the main shrubs, which form the bulk of the hedge. And this dense cover provided by a well-managed shrubby hedgerow is so important. And it's why management of hedgerows is so important. Uh, sadly, because of the lack of management or a decline in quality and understanding in management of hedgerows, we are seeing a decline in that shrubby component. And without it being kept shrubby and dense, the interiors become more open and therefore wildlife that's in the hedge is more exposed to the elements, but also exposed to predators as well. So that decline in quality in hedge is leading to a decline of hedgerow species. Um, and sadly, a lot of those species also include some of those really charismatic farmland bird species, including the lovely turtle dove, bullfinches, and also a beautiful linnet, which is featured in the picture here. So hedgerow base, maybe when you've thought of hedgerows, you haven't necessarily even thought of the hedgerow base, let alone of it being valuable to hedgerow species and how the hedgerow can function. But actually, around 41% of priority species are reliant or need the hedgerow base as well. And this real area can really form that safe highway to a lot of species other than the birds and bats. So safe highway for newts and frogs and toads, of course, all of those invertebrates, as well as hedgehogs migrating and hunting along them as well. Not only that, hedgerow bases are a buffer zone to protect root systems, which can be an important habitat in their own right as well. So just to highlight a couple of species, again, that you might not necessarily think of, but reed bunting and other ground nesting species will often nest at the base of hedgerows. So your garden ground nesting bird species that you might not know about, robins and wrens nest on or very close to the ground. I once found a robin nest just in a little pile of leaves, not in a hedgerow, just on a path on a nature reserve and we had to kind of build a decoy like path that went off in a different direction we want to highlight to people that there was this robin nest in the leaves on the floor but we also didn't want it to get stood on luckily they were able to fledge chicks but yeah that hedgerow base area can form a little bit more protection than just some leaves on the ground for some of these species and help to provide that barrier to predators as well so another part of the hedge which often gets forgotten is that hedgerow margin. And this can really help to protect the hedge. Not only is it fantastic habitat in its own right, but in a farming environment, it can stop the hedge necessarily getting as overmanaged, can stop as much runoff getting for it. So it can really help to protect and form that buffer zone. But it's also a really interesting and dynamic habitat in its own right, especially if it's left to get longer like this, can be tussocky, have flowering species in it and species that live in it independently. Now, this is looking at it from a farming environment, but if you're looking at this in a garden concept, you might want to have a flowering flower bed with lots of different flowers that flower at different times, native species to fill that niche of the hedgerow margin. So in a farming environment, around 34% of biodiversity action plant species uh, find the hedgerow margin important. It's obviously a really great source of nectar and pollen for invertebrates, and in turn is a really great source of food for birds and small mammals, as well as providing seeds and the invertebrates to eat. And lots of uh, species will nest in these tall margins as well, not least of all, the very charismatic harvest mouse, as pictured here. And then, Although not an element of the hedge in itself, deadwood is incredibly important and that plant litter, which I was talking about a little bit earlier. Uh, it's really valuable habitat to invertebrates, which then provides food for invertebrate predators. So your small mammals and birds, it's also good cover for the small mammals. And, but also, as we were saying about how the base can help protect root systems, by having that deadwood and the plant litter left behind, it can help to enhance that and protect that area and at the base of the hedge. When you're laying a hedge, you do remove a lot of deadwood because you have to be able to get at the stems and pleaches. But in many styles, and what we do with 
hedgerow heritage, you then weave some of that dead wood and put it back in the hedge afterward because it is just so valuable and helps to enhance the area. So obviously from those components, once again, it's another of the, the big buzzwords of the webinar, diversity is key. Lots of different features appeal to lots of different wildlife. The more different features you've got, the more diverse in composition, the more species it can support simultaneously and get those the variety of native species. And all of this can be achieved through good management. So how do we achieve this good management? Um, hedges won't do it on their own sort of said before, they are successional plants. They are all individual trees at the end of the day that are trying to become really big ancient trees eventually. So we have to intervene to be able to get this kind of structure out of our hedgerows. We're back to hedge laying. So I'm just gonna give you a quick whistle stop tour of what hedge laying encompasses. This is not a hedge laying course. Don't Please don't feel like you should be able to go away and lay a hedge from this, but it gives you a flavour of what you can do and hopefully shows you that anybody can do it. I mean, I cannot stress enough, if I can lay hedges, you can lay hedges. <laughs> but hedge laying, it really is a winter activity when sap isn't running through the stems. You lay the plant over by cutting the stem or pleach, which hopefully you can see in this picture. Here we've laid down but it's still connected to the base here. And so it can still be fed, nutrients can still get to the plant. But because we've cut it off here, lots more shoots can spring up and will help to create that bushy, denser effect. And this is how it really regenerates the plant. So this is that elm hedge that I was telling you about before. And all of this darker material where it's been laid over is, is rot and dying. So all of it in here. And because we've cut it back like this, lots of new shoots should jump up from here and will bring new life to that elm hedge. And that's what we mean when we say coppicing. And more stems, bushier plants, creates more structure and diversity. And that's how we really create that living boundary and in the way that you might be then be able to remove some of those fence panels from your garden and create a stock barrier on farmland or denote where you want people to go in a nature reserve or in other habitats. Uh, you don't need to stake and bind it. Some of the hedge laying styles that I didn't feel like I had enough time to get into do not use stakes and binders, but it can help to obviously form that structure. The idea between the, by the stakes and binders is that they do break down and decay over time, um, but that will take a few years and by that point, the hedge will be supporting itself. So it doesn't need it, but it can help. If you're interested in learning more about hedge laying and want to give it a go or learn how to do it, there's loads of courses out there, lots run by hedge laying organisations, lots going on in Surrey, or of course you could do it through Hedgerow Heritage. And there's lots of resources online if you just want to give it a go. So you've laid your hedge, you're all done, right? Unfortunately not. Uh, hedgerows are dynamic and successional and so we'll need ongoing management. But we do want that management to be sympathetic. That doesn't mean you're cutting it back every year. And unfortunately, if you're not managing it ongoing, you can end up with hedges like the pictured in this one. And that sympathetic management is not only going to stop it becoming like this, but you are extending its life and it, you are going to get a healthier hedge out of it. But saying that, we also don't want you to overmanage the head. So constant long-term trimming at the same height in the same places every year puts the hedge under massive stress, which can lead to deterioration. And that kind of bottomless mushroom effect is how we kind of refer to it. And it's kind of in this picture as well. You can see you've got a thick base and it's very holy and just a little bit at the top, but even that is starting to die out in parts. So also overmanagement bad. And what we want you to do, or what's ideal, is to take the lifestyle approach, life cycle, namaste, and recognise the value of the life cycle of the hedge. And, uh, and unfortunately for some people, the healthiest hedge may not be the neatest hedge, but that's okay. We like things to be a bit messy and a rough around the edges sometimes. And what you're trying to do with that ongoing management 
is slow down, but not altogether halt the natural changes that the hedge wants to go through. You want to slow down it becoming that big tree. You want to keep it in those younger stages with lots of new growth, but also where you've cut it, you may get dead sections or older areas, and you're getting that diversity in structure, but also that diversity of age structure as well. And again, like we were saying, diversity is key, and not just in the areas of the hedge, but also the age and the size. And by doing this on all hedges on a holding, we can achieve that ideal mosaic of different shapes and sizes that make our countryside and our gardens so special. You have areas that you've cut some years and then others that you, other parts of it that you've left and you can create something really interesting and interesting to wildlife as well. So perhaps at this point, you're feeling a little bit overwhelmed. You, I've thrown a lot of information at you about managing hedgerows, whether it's in your garden or in a farmland environment, parkland. So I thought we'd just use some time to summarize and these are Katie's big top management 10 tips. Easy for me to say. So number one, keep it thick and dense. You want those close interwoven branches that are gonna form that really safe sanctuary for wildlife and provide lots of nesting, roosting and hiding places. And if you start doing this in your garden or in any place, you're going to get lots of thrushes, finches, robins, sparrows, dunnocks and wrens using it a lot. And obviously, if you don't manage this, those open edge hedges will attract more predators. Holly is a good one to consider because they're compact and dense bushes and provide excellent protection even during the winter. Number two, cut it at the right time, which is late winter. And you want to leave as much food source for wildlife through the winter. I feel like last weekend is a really good example. Things can get very cold and very, uh, very hazardous for wildlife. It would have been very difficult for them to find food. So leaving things with berries and other fruit will provide vital food for birds, such as field fare and red wing and other finches, and finches, thrushes all the way through the winter. And obviously the earlier you cut, the less food will be available for them. So if you do have to cut, try and leave some fruiting area for them so that there's as much for them for as long a period during the year as possible. And please, please never cut your hedges or your trees during the breeding bird season, which runs from the 1st of March to the 1st of September. Don't cut too often or too tight. So you actually only need to do this every two or three years and not all of it potentially. So you don't want to cut it all to the same point at the same time of year every year. Let it grow up and out a little, let it go wild. Um, if wild isn't your bag, then try maybe just cutting one side or the top and leave some areas with those fruiting bodies and to age a little bit longer. So even if you're having to cut it right back, like we were talking about those standing trees maybe leave some fruit bearing opportunities for wildlife. And as an example, one mature hawthorn can produce as many berries as a 200 meter hedge, which is cut every year. So it just shows that variety in what you can achieve. Number four, encourage native shrubs. So you really are aiming for a range of different species which provide food throughout the year. So for example, willows and blackthorn will be a really good source of early nectar from sort of March, April time, and then hawthorn, bramble and rose for summer flowers and autumn berries. And then we keep coming back to ivy and those slightly problematic species, but their ivy is really fantastic for autumn nectar and late winter berries. Five, encourage flowers and grasses at the base and margins. So we've kind of talked a lot about this already, but the vegetation at the base supports lots of wildlife as much as higher up at times. So some examples of nice native flowers you can have are primrose and knapweed, which provide nectar and pollen for bees and other pollinators, but there's loads of things you can do at the base of your hedge. Lots of different flowering species. Just having a really nice dynamic flower bed at the base of your hedge will improve that area for wildlife. Um, if you don't want to go down the flower route, Tussocky grasses provide safe places for beetles, spiders and the likes during winter as well. And obviously we don't really see it, but grasses flower as well. So there is those pollen opportunities too. 
And obviously frogs, toads, newts, lizards like that dense base as well as lots of other things. Number six, look after trees or plant new ones. So big mature trees, especially native ones like oak and ash and beech will increase the amount of wildlife that use the hedge tremendously. Um, insects will congregate around the crown and beneath the canopy, providing rich feeding for birds and bats, which is obviously what we've been going through already. And then smaller trees like holly and rowan and crabapple are also really valuable um, with their berries and their nectaring opportunities. Now, obviously, this is a hedge in a field and isn't going to be appropriate for everyone's garden. So I've also included the garden version. And it's just kind of to demonstrate that one size doesn't fit all and doing what you can, no matter what the space you have, will be helpful to something. So there is a slightly larger flowering apple tree in the corner here, as well as some denser, taller, older trees towards the end. Variety does count. It doesn't all have to be massive, though. Seven, rejuvenating your hedge. So now we're really talking about that hedge laying element. Uh, but obviously they can be kept bushy by cutting them right back occasionally. So you need to cut it close to ground level so they can send up all those new stems, which is coppicing and begin that fresh new young growth. Um, and you can lay it in this way. Cutting it right back will also help. And you just need to work out what's right for your area, whether that's a garden, farmland or nature reserve. This won't work for conifers. If you cut them right back, it will kill the plant. But no one's going to want any conifers after this presentation. So we don't need to worry about that. So when establishing a hedge, take care with the, with the plant species that you choose. I've been talking basically to myself on a screen too long. I'm going to start mumbling my words now. <laughs> so you need to take care of the plant species that you're choosing. So a lot of people do go for those conifer species and other non-native options because they are really quick growing and you get quick results from them. But too often than not, they get too high and are too difficult to maintain really quickly. And if you're really unlucky, it can lead to neighbor disputes as well as other issues. So really think carefully before choosing your shrubs and trees. And another note on the native plants, they don't get out of control too quickly. You will definitely have the opposite problem if you're picking those native plants. They will stay smaller for longer. And so when you can, if you're looking at planting the hedge or how you're shaping it, do try and link it in with other wild habitats to fill in the gaps. So like we said, wildlife doesn't like open spaces. Try and link it to other hedges, woodland, pond, flower beds, just stop those open spaces and create those lovely safe passages for wildlife that are in both rural and urban areas. And 10, lastly, but certainly not least, explore your hedge, enjoy it. I know I'm biased, but hedgerows really are a joy and they are teeming with life. And it can be such a wonderful thing to explore them and understand and get an idea about what lives in them. And you can get to know which parts of your hedge are used more at different times of year, what kind of species are using them. And when you get to understand it better like this, you can start to tailor your tinkering accordingly. If you find stuff really using a certain part in the autumn, then don't cut that back much or just give it a very light trim really late in winter. Which bits of flowering, when, how can you promote it? How can you help it? And I can only promise like, that you will get a joy from it and wildlife will be using it and thanking you too. And not only enjoy it and experience that joy, but share that joy as well. So this picture in the top left is a picture from the Sunday magazine from 1890, and it's children gathering dog roses. And it's certainly no secret that we don't have the same relationship with our natural spaces and our countryside like we have done in years gone by. But that doesn't mean that we can't recapture that and re-energize it and share it with the next generation. Now, whatever that looks like, get people out it, share it with your children, your grandchildren, your neighbors, your friends. All of mine think I'm a complete bird nerd, but they love it. And the picture here at the bottom is a group of guides who came out and did some planting on Bonhurst back in I think it was February last year, just before the pandemic hit, and that hedge is doing really well now. 
So I'm sort of coming to the end now, but I wanted to share this slide because it was on the last presentation and I think it sums it up really well. The, our, our countryside is changing and it is quite a dangerous place at times for wildlife and hedgerows really are a vital link through that habitat and provide that continuity in ways that our countryside wouldn't be able to otherwise. It allows wildlife safe passage through these ever more dangerous surrounds and helping to prevent populations from becoming isolated. And I'm gonna share the same analogy as I did last week, but hedgerows truly are the wild highways through our countryside and populations can become as stuck as we do when a road floods or a bridge breaks. But unlike for us, no one's looking to repair those bridges or clear that flood water for wildlife. But it doesn't stop there. They're not just highways, they're also homes and nurseries, they're the local shopping market, they're B&Q and they're even John Lewis. They're filling so many niches and they really should be valued by us and they certainly need our protection. Which brings me back to hedgerow heritage and all of the surveying that we're going to be doing going forward into the spring and summer. We really want to change the fate of the hedgerow starting in the North Downs in Surrey. So we will be beginning that surveying effort and then we'll be back out planting and laying hedgerows in the autumn, fingers crossed. So if you'd like to get involved with Hedgerow Heritage, please sign up as a volunteer and state that you're interested in Hedgerow Heritage. If you're already a volunteer, then drop me an email or email info at, and they'll put you in touch with me. So we got there with me falling all over my words by the end, but thank you so much for coming and listening to, again, why I think hedgerows are fantastic, but then also getting into that management element and delving a bit deeper. And I hope that all of you are uh, understand a little bit more about hedgerows, but also their management, and maybe even inspired to give it a go and have hedgerows in your wild spaces. So thank you very much. And are there any questions? Brilliant, Katie. Thank you so much for that. Was uh, I feel I've I've learned so much about hedgerows in in like you say a bit of a whistle stop tour, but it's absolutely fascinating. Um, I, yeah, I feel I want to come out and join you and and lay a hedge. But um, luckily, we're going to be working on a project ourselves, aren't we, with the school? So uh, maybe mm -hmm. I'll be able to uh, to join you that way. So brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Thank you very much. Now I know there are quite a few questions that are uh, popping into the Q&A session. Um, so I'm going to pass you over to my lovely co-presenter Sue and she will um, ask you some of these lovely questions, Katie. Katie, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. I really learned a lot. Um, but we do have a lot of questions, so I'm just going to start off. Um, Christine has asked, what is BioBlitz, please? Could you explain that a little bit, please? Oh, yeah, of course. That's a, It's funny, isn't it? You When you're in the... Uh, in the industry or a sector for long enough, you forget that some of these words aren't commonplace, but uh, BioBlitz is a kind of event that organizations will do and companies even, where you go out over a day, a weekend or a set period of time and identify as much as you possibly can in that space in the amount of time that you have. So it's a really great way to engage with communities and young people and also really generate some citizen science and some data about what's in those natural spaces. Being the nerd that I am, I've done a bio blitz of my own garden in the past, so anyone can do it. And can they find out more about that on the website or um, how to get involved with that? Uh, yep, it will be on the website. We haven't got any of the bio blitz events in the diary at the moment just because of the ongoing COVID situation. But as time goes on. But as time goes on, they will be up and on the events page like everything else. Brilliant, thanks. Okay, then um, Susanna's uh, sent a note saying, where, ha where has the green growth come from on the dead hedge, please? Bramble, ivy, something else? Yeah, that's exactly the sort of thing it will be. Again, it's those kind of often pest species or plants that you think of, but yeah, a dead hedge that ends up with some, oh, hang on, which one are we talking about here? I imagine. Are you talking about the one from the nature reserve or the pictures of the ones in gardens? 
Um, it didn't say, I think it would just be a general question. So the ones from the nature reserve, it's holly. So that's very soon after it's been laid. And uh, so the dead hedge has been put down. So the holly is still green. So it's just the holly plants itself. But quite often dead hedging does green up because it gets things like holly itself or ivy and bramble, if not moss and grasses growing in and around and on it anyway. So the one on the nature reserve was because it was only just recently created, but there's lots of other ways they can become green as well. Okay, I hope that answers the question. Um, now, Bill sent in a uh, question that I also wanted to ask you. It's, um, can hedges be protected by law as they are basically SSIs? So I am not an expert in law, but, I, but hedgerows are increasingly being recognized as one of our most important habitats and are starting to get protection themselves. So not quite triple SI status, but yes, it is. There's increasing amounts of funding available for hedgerows and then also protection for them as well. And if hedgerows do fall on triple SIs and are linked to that designation, for anyone that doesn't know, triple SI means special site of scientific interest. Um, if that designation is linked to the habitat, including the hedgerow, then the hedgerow will automatically be protected. But things can be a triple SI for all sorts of reasons. We manage a sealed chalk pit, which is a triple SI, and that's because of the chalk face itself. And so we find ourselves removing vegetation from it to preserve the face. So it depends on the designation, but yes, they are starting to get more recognition and be better protected. Great, thanks. Uh, now, Peter's had a couple of questions here, so I'm gonna ask the first one. Uh, after you've laid a hedge, do you just need to trim the top of it in the following years, or would you need to lay it again in say 10 years time? That's a really good question. And it depends on a few things. So it's not necessarily a short or quick answer. It would depend how often you're cutting it back, um, how sympathetic that management is, whether it's been right for the hedge, and the kind of species that are in it as well and how quickly they're growing up. I'd say if you get the management just right and you're tinkering with it and cutting a little bit back every two to three years, like I was saying, then perhaps not. But uh, it, it could do. You could use need to, or need is a kind of a relative term. Do you think it would look better if it would be laid again in 10 years? It may well do. And it's only going to add to that bushy growth as well. So it would depend on the hedge and how you've managed it and actually what you want for the hedge as well. Okay, that, and following on from that, he's also asked, which you've kind of answered a little bit, also in a garden situation, could you just keep pruning the tips to encourage bushy growth or do you really need to coppice or lay to get that full bushy growth? To get the full bushy growth, you're going to need to do something like laying it because you only really get that from cutting it right back down to the base. By trimming it back, you are going to promote new growth, but obviously you do run the risk of over trimming it sometimes as well, trying to get more. Sometimes less is more, but you'll definitely get more from laying it. We To achieve that kind of effect with that bushy hedge, we would always lay it. Okay. All right, good. Um, okay, so Christine has asked, what plants would you recommend for a really small urban garden? That's a good question. Can you say that one again quickly, please? Sure. Um, what plants would you recommend for a really small urban garden? Ooh, okay. Now yeah, we really could be. <laughs> Um, so uh, the first, so, oh, so much. Um, I'll try and let's cut it down. <laughs> try, try, try. Top five, top five. <laughs> so um, bird's foot trefoil jumps to mind. And that's known, is kind of gets a reputation as being one of the most biodiverse plants because it's known to be like one of the plants that most uh wildlife benefits from nectaring on so the most invertebrates are known to nectar on that one plant so you can tick a lot of boxes with that one plant uh some other really good ones for small urban gardens uh black knapweed is a really nice plant as well so it's really attractive and a really fantastic nectaring species and really easy to get established um maybe if it's a really small urban garden what i might 
recommend people do is look into kind of vertical options as well. So what you can plant up a wall species and what um, up a wall and what you can hang. People do really interesting things with um, like vertical shoe tidies where you can plant lots of different little types of trailing plants and things that grow up at the top. So there's some really exciting options that you can do with things like that and can vastly increase the number of plants that you can have. Um, if you're going to go for five, I would say you want what you would want to do is have nectar really early in the season until as late as the season as well. So things like your primrose, which flower really early, that's really good to have. And then your ivy is going to provide autumn nectar, but then those winter berries as well. So that's really vital. Um, so there's uh, are there any like sites or anything that people can get ideas from that you would recommend? Or is it just a general? Um, so I would always recommend Pinterest for innovative ways of doing things with space. And I get a lot of my garden ideas from sites like that. So even if it's a small urban garden, pallet gardens as well. And you can plant lots of things. So there's lots of different vertical options. Uh, there's some really good seed mixes out there as well. But just, just Googling like native seeds and things like that. And I can't remember, is there stuff on our website about wildlife gardening? There has been in the There isn't, there will be, because that's going to be there a big, yeah. That's so going to be a big thing. So yeah. I think Watch the Space and Watch Surrey Wildlife Trust, as well as other um, wildlife charity organisations, there's some really good ideas in there. And I, I think there are definitely some videos about things you can do in your garden, because I've definitely made some of them, and they're really cringe, but, you know, you might <laughs> <laughs> about how to attract wildlife to your garden so I know I've done a deadwood one and I did a pond one and I may I think I might have even done some uh veg patch ones and various things so there's lots it's all of about having fun right <laughs> oh yeah just smiling through lockdown <laughs> <laughs> there you go um okay that's great um and let's see and uh, Christine has also asked um about volunteering I know you mentioned volunteering before and um she has actually volunteered hasn't heard anything back yet be patient Christine um lots of people are volunteering and we will definitely be getting back to you so if anybody else has experienced not getting um hearing anything back yet you will be hearing soon yeah, I'll, I'll 100% take that on the chin. I have been bogged down in webinar prep, but my one of my things on my to-do list for next week is to get back to all the people that have recently signed up to be a volunteer. But don't worry, you won't miss out because we won't be able to do anything from spring onwards anyway. Oh, that's true. That's true. Um, so this is a good question from Andrew. Um, are there grants available for new hedgerow creation? That's a really good question. And yes, there are lots of grants out there for hedgerow creation at the moment. What I would say is you'll watch out because there's a lot of value placed on hedgerows and hedgerow plants, but again, not that necessarily that understanding about the management going on. So you can very much get grants and opportunities to buy the plants and plant a hedgerow, but there's not necessarily the same funding available for ongoing management yet we are getting the words out there. <laughs> fingers crossed, fingers crossed. Yeah. <laughs> good, good. Um, let's see, Claire has a question. She, sounds like she might have some problems with a neighbor. Um, what can be planted to enhance a necessary fence? <laughs> yeah, so I think a fast growing one. <laughs> yeah. um, well, again, so you don't necessarily have to have a hedgerow or a fence. So you know, I'm, I'm a big advocate for trying to remove fences where we can so that we can create that continuity and, you know, things like hedgehogs and other wildlife can move through the areas, but it's just not practical for everyone. Um, so you can just plant a hedgerow up against a fence. So, you know, all the same options yeah. up there without the fence are there if the fence is there too. Oh, good. Okay. Good idea. Um, okay, so uh, Peter, again, has um, asked a question. In a small garden, is it best to do a double row of mixed native hedge plants? And is it too close to plant the rows 40 centimeters apart? Do the plants do better if it's further apart? We're getting technical now. I like yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks, Peter. I'm, I'm with my people. <laughs> Um, I would say it, it doesn't largely matter. You know, you've got to you've got to make the space work for you. So when we're planting hedgerows out on nature reserves, we do do that double 
layer of planting and that double row of plants but you don't feel like you have to get it get right what's perfect on the nature nature site or on a nature reserve for your garden so if you're losing loads of space by having a sing by having a double layer it is okay to have a single layer but you will get a thicker bushier hedge if you have that double layer and them being uh, like the 40 centimeters apart or whatever it is so don't feel like you've got to get it perfect you know it sounds like you want to do everything right for the hedge and I think even if you had a single layer and laid it and managed it well you'll still get a bushy effect but you may want you may want that extra bushy effect so yeah you would want to have a double layer of plants oh good all right um so now we've got uh, Helen she's saying our our hawthorn hedge has lots of gaps especially near larger trees what's best to encourage it to get thicker cutting right back where it's thin or adding some new plants so I feel like we're in the danger zone now where I'm going to recommend something and it's going to <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so it sounds like it needs to be laid. I have I haven't seen it, but I would say it needs to be like cut cut quite heavily back. But laying it doesn't necessarily mean just cutting everything off. If you do cut everything off, it's entirely likely that you will get lots of new growth. But sometimes there are factors at play that you know you're not necessarily aware of. It sounds like some of the areas aren't getting enough sunlight with those big big branches so whether you can cut back some of those big branches let more light in from other there could be stuff going on beneath the soil um i've i mean i had family members getting in touch saying what's happened to my tree and from what it sounded like was that there's a herbicide had been put on a neighbor's garden and it had leached through to theirs so you don't know what's going on under the soil but in general laying the hedge and cutting it right back will promote new growth which will help it to bush out now if you don't have experience in hedge laying you might want to get someone in to do it or watch some tutorials beforehand i wouldn't just go off what i've said no it's not because i tend to plant something if there's a gap so it's it, you're saying encourage the existing growth rather than just plant. yeah but you can you can also gap up as well now that's a really good point sue so if you do have gaps in it and you don't want to take on the hedge laying you can plant new plants in around it but those plants are going to have to compete what's, with what's there already as well. Yeah, uh, fair, fair point. Um, Chris has asked, would you encourage or discourage letting hops grow along and through a hedge? Uh, I'm no expert in hops, but I would probably allow it. I think it's a really nice addition. They yeah. provide lots of nectar to invertebrates. It's extra structure. It can kind of fill the niche of holly, um, not holly, ivy in some ways. We'll get some like botanist expert on and go, hops, <laughs> niche at all, you idiot. But you know, that same kind of creeping plant with nectar opportunities in the same way that I wouldn't see ivy as a problem. I wouldn't see hops and you're just lucky to have them in your garden, really. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, Bernie has, first of all, said fantastic presentation. Thank you, Katie. Um, but she, um, you also mentioned that conifers are not great. Is you OK? And also, if undergrowth is left, then if undergrowth is left, the nettles tend to take over. Are nettles OK? Ah, lovely question. And um, you is great. You is a native, uh, a native tree, and just another one of those tree species that can form part of a hedge. So yeah, no, Hugh is Hugh. <laughs> <laughs> you is lovely, and also nettles are great. Now another one that gets a bad rep, and I do spend a considerable amount of time each year pulling up nettles from my garden, but only in some places. So nettles really are a fantastic uh, source of thing of food and protection, nectar. Uh, for loads of stuff. For example, the peacock butterfly lays its eggs on um, nettles and feeds almost exclude the caterpillars and they feed almost exclusively on it. And lots of nectar opportunities like nettles are really fantastic to loads of wildlife. So if you don't, if you're happy to have a patch in your garden where nettles can come in, then they're a really good thing to have as well. Oh, that's good. And now she did ask one more question. Um, are there any native plants that are better for birds? Um, well, lots of, I mean, 
some birds prefer certain plants to others you know some might be slightly more beneficial but if you've got native native plants in your garden quite often the ones that people most associate with weeds are the best ones to have so anything native growing you know if people know garlic mustard um it's kind of a very leafy plant but with white flowers honesty daisies and pink clover sort of things that you get in your lawn as well all those native plants that sometimes get the rep of weeds but i call beautiful wildflowers are uh, all good for invertebrates and therefore will be feeding birds oh good all right um okay so richard he's asked how long after planting a new hedge should one consider laying or coppicing it that's a great question yeah. With all the great questions, there's no quick, easy answer. Um, that will depend, really. It will depend on how quickly it grows, which can depend on a whole host of uh, question of factors. So it will depend on how much light the hedge is getting, whether it's getting enough water, and what the nutrients in the soil and what the soil type is like. I've really fascinatingly seen a hedge that was planted on a slope, and the stuff at the bottom was growing higher up than the stuff uh, here <laughs> there. and it was purely because it wasn't getting as much water as the rest of the hedge and so therefore it was really stunting its growth so you if you plant a native hedge you've got a good few years like i'd say around seven ish depending on the conditions but it it can vary wildly some hedges are ready to depending on the age of the plants when you put them in could be ready to lay in three years or so, but you're not gonna have to plant your hedge and then instantly lay it, let's put it that way. Oh, very good. Um, Stephen's asked a question that I'm always curious about. Is it illegal to cut a hedge during the March to September bird nesting season? Yes. It is illegal. Oh, it is, okay. it is, but it's one of these ones where it, you don't really people don't really get prosecuted on it so you're breaking the wildlife and country so wildlife oh. and Wide act yeah not just code act so it is it, you know in the same all birds in the uk are really heavily protected um we are a nation of bird lovers but it's very difficult to enforce um and really is just done on sort of good nature and people just trying to keep to it and just and it's bad practice it's it's really bad practice yeah because you can disturb so much and depend you can sometimes assess in the hedge and make sure that there's nothing breeding in it so you if you really need to cut something back obviously don't let that stop you you can check the area and make sure there's nothing breeding in it and then you can do the work but sometimes it's just impossible to tell and I mean, a story of mine from when i was a child it broke my heart um, even before I realised I was a bird nerd, but um, the neighbours across the street cut back all the ivy off their house during breeding bird season. And this is maybe a horrible story to tell, but there was loads of dead baby birds all over. The and they were the loveliest people in the world and would never have wanted to do it, but they just didn't realise. And, you know, there was no hard feelings. They didn't know, you know, I didn't know about, I must have only been six or seven and I didn't know about breeding bird season so it's quite often about education again and just getting the point out there and so spread the word <laughs> spread the word it's what it's all about very good well we have only one last question and this is from Janet um is the dead hedge best placed on bare ground or would it work on a hard surface I'm thinking of creating one in a corner of my garden which has some old paving still in place um I think if you want to create some on your paving, then that's absolutely fine. You may get slightly more benefits from the bare ground in that you'll get damper areas and you've got that soil and earthworms can come up more easily and things like that. But if the space you've got is on a bit of paving, then have it on your paving. You know, you get frogs and snails and lizards and all sorts that are using paving stones because you've used, because it's built on the paving won't stop things using it, certainly. Oh, very good. Oh, well, Katie, you are just a wealth of knowledge. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you for having me again. You bet. Over to you, Emma. 
Wow, yeah, that was brilliant. Some really good questions. Um, yeah, they so tested me. They did. And I think I hopefully, um, Susanna, I um, asked you the question about the green on the on the head, the dead hedgerow. And um, she, the other question was relating to, yes, the picture that you mentioned. So hopefully, Susanna, that's answered, Katie answered your question um, for you because you put another question in the chat about that. Um, so with, with that, I think we've, um, yeah, we've done all our questions. Um, just to say another massive thank you to, um, to Katie again for a brilliant presentation this evening, two weeks in a row. Um, what will we do next Thursday without you? My goodness. Go out me. and plant some hedges. <laughs> <laughs> but there are plenty more um, talks and presentations coming up in the next few weeks. Um, so please check our, our website. Um, I know Sophie's been very busy getting new more presenters um, signed up. So um, keep an eye out for that. Um, but really, we just yes, we just wanted to say a, a huge big thank you to all our, all of you for coming once again to join us. Um, it's um, you know your continued support as as members of the trust uh, is fabulous um, and I know some people have have um, donated to the talk tonight I know it is a free talk for members but some people have kindly donated um, towards this evening's talk um, which we are enormously grateful for um, it really helps us um, through these tricky times when we can't see you for real um, but yeah no please go on the website um, that's you've got the opportunity there to not only have these lovely presentations but Sue and I also are going to do a little promo for all our adult learning courses as well we've got some on, wonderful online courses coming up um, with some mindfulness courses happening uh, all sorts of different things so go and check them out and see if there's something there that takes your fancy um, but yeah we hope you've really enjoyed this evening and uh, thank you very much Sue for being a wonderful um, question and answering person and to you Katie and to everybody who's joined us this evening um, and we hope to see you again very soon. <laughs>